Hi folks, this is Mark from Tabletopia here, and thank you for joining me for 9 design tips for your Tabletopia game. I'm going to run you through a couple of really quick and simple ways that you can elevate your game and bring it to the next level. And the best bit about making a game on Tabletopia is that there's no coding required, there's no scripting, you just need a couple of hours of your time and the ability to work with graphics. And really that's it. Um, so. Before we get into that, I'm just going to briefly recap Tabletopia for those who don't know or for those who just need a quick refresher. So, Tabletopia is a digital sandbox and it lets you play your favorite games online. There is no automation. So by digital sandbox, we actually mean that there's no rules enforcement. You play it your way. And you need to know the rules beforehand. So we give players the pieces, they play the game for themselves. Uh, it's it's kind of like li real life in that way. It's like sitting across the table from another player. Because you're actually moving the pieces yourself. It's not a robot doing it, it's not the AI. Uh, you're actually manipulating things. And it kind of gives you that really nice feeling of being with someone, especially when you couple it with Discord or Zoom or another video chat service. So it's playable in multiple ways. It's available on the web browser, on the Steam application, uh, and we have a limited selection of games on iOS and the Android apps. Um, mostly free, some are premium. Uh, so we have a premium service where you can have a monthly subscription to get access to our premium catalog. But actually 80% 80, 80 of our catalog is available for free. Um, premium games are also revenue shared with the developers. So by playing those premium games, you are directly supporting the developers of those games. And I think that's a really cool thing. Everything on the platform is completely official and 100% sanctioned by the creators of those games. We get half a million users a month and over 100,000 active players. Um, our top games see about 4,000 hours of uh, playtime and thousands of players every month. So it's a really nice way to get your game seen by people. And when you put your game on Tabletopia, you're in good company. We work with a lot of really reputable publishers and distributors and designers to get their games seen by people and played by people in the digital space. So, you know, we work with Stonemaier Games, we work with uh, Mayday Games, we're working with Cosmos, Arcane Wonders, uh, Board and Dice. We have some fantastic people that uh, we regularly collaborate with and um, get their games uh, out there, which I think is a real good thing that we all could use right now. So, here's some quotes by some fun people. Um, Vital, uh, of course, makes all those very heavy games, but uh, funnily enough, those games are very playable on our platform, which is really remarkable, actually. Uh, Jamie Stegmeier, the publisher of um, such wonderful games as Scythe and Wingspan, uh, Ryan Lockett makes some brilliant storytelling games and so there's quite a variety of games that get onto our platform and so come join the party. All right, let's get into it. Let's talk nine design tips for your Tabletopia game. The first thing to consider is taking advantage of the digital space. You are not recreating a one-for-one -one board game. You're going to be reformatting your board game so that it fits into a digital space. And it's about using the same logical principles you would for a physical board game layout, but applying them to a digital space. So let's uh, discuss a few tips that help you with that. The first thing to think about is managing your space, and, and you need to try and reach a compromise. Uh, a table that is too big forces players to move back and forth, and remember, they're not just reaching their arm out, they're actually dragging a mouse across a screen. So you want to make sure that all your information is compact in a way that's accessible. But don't make it too small, or you're going to have uh, situations where game objects are going to overlap each other, or collide, or players are trying to pick up the wrong thing. So you want to make sure that it's a nice balance that allows players to actually interact in the space properly. Uh, now, use logical object placement. Uh, put shared objects so that they're accessible to everyone. Uh, you want to make sure that a common resource pool, for example, can be reached by most people. You want to make sure that you also place objects uh, players use more often closer to them. So if a player is particularly reliant on a specific resource, make sure that they can reach it, reach it uh, more often than other players. 
you also want to make sure to study study the trajectory of objects. So look at how players interact in the space. Do they need to reach out? Do they need to move across the table? Do they need to actually basically you want to sort of assess what the user experience is going to be like and you want to make sure that you're accommodating for it in the most streamlined way possible. So try not to put objects too close to each other as well um, or players will end up selecting the wrong thing. Um, you also want to make sure that you orient objects in the right direction to as many players as possible and check if you have a place and a reason to put a reference card on the table itself. This can be really handy so the players can just double click it, bring up uh, into focus the reference and actually have a quick guide. That means they don't have to go back through the rule book and skim. And uh, it, it really just sort of streamlines things. And it's actually something that uh, gives you an advantage over physical when you can have references that are split up into more contextual situations. And the other thing is to lock objects that shouldn't be used during the gameplay. So for example, if a player board is always going to be present, lock it off. So the players can't accidentally pick it up and just throw their pieces everywhere because they're going to be constantly clicking on things on top of that. So you want to make sure that your players don't accidentally manipulate something they really shouldn't. Now I'm going to talk about counters and bags. Counters and bags are really useful tools in Tabletopia that are unique to the digital space and they'll help you conserve the table presence and make sure that you're really taking full advantage of what's in front of you. So let's look at counters first. Here we have the game Northgard, uh, Uncharted Lands. Now in the typical game, uh, there's about 60 different resource tokens that are used to just track the resources you accumulate throughout the game. But you'll see here, we've actually just replaced them with three, four icons. And these can just be scrolled up and down as such. And they're a way to just track your resources without having to, you know, drag from a pool and put them back and place them on. And, and it's really just a nifty way to compress the amount of space that you're going to be using in the game. And now let's talk about bags. Here in Terra Mystica, in the two to five player setup, we actually have all the player counts, all the player boards out here, but we're not going to be using them all in the game. So we've got two bags, which are just going to sort of help us conserve space. We have this discard bag here, and that's actually useful for letting you pick the player uh, board that you want to use. And then once you've, once you've eliminated the options you don't want, you can just select all of that and just discard it. It's like a TARDIS bag. It kind of just sucks up all the things that you don't need. And we can do that for all the player boards we won't actually be using. So, for example, if we're not using this one, we can just discard that. And now it's a lot more compact and you're able to utilize the space much more efficiently. You also see here we've got a bag that contains workers. So um, unlike Northgard, where we were able to compact the amount of uh, tokens we had, uh, in Terra Mystica, it's important that you have workers available in a pool. But you can just drag them out of this bag and now you can place them as needed. But they're not taking up a giant puddle of space uh, on the side of the board. In Tabletopia, you can actually use the surface of the uh, game board in order to emphasize things. So, for example, you can create an aura of light around really important objects, or you can highlight a deck, or you can actually put text on the table in order to in indicate what type of deck something is, or maybe indicate where a discard pile should go. Let's have a look at some examples. So you'll see here we're in the game Cartographers. And you'll see that they've actually put down all this text, edicts, scoring cards, the play area. But all of these things are actually etched into the surface of the game. Um, when you're creating the game, this is just nine JPEGs all laid out in a grid that lead to this, this surface that's actually part of the game board. So you can see here they've used it to sort of indicate the different tokens that you can grab out of the bags the discard pile where it should go so i'll just pop it there the seasons the scoring cards and where the play area should be so by using the surface they've actually managed to 
really emphasize the different areas of play that players will interact with. You can also hear, see here, they've created like this halo of light and that's just used to sort of draw your eye in to the, to the important play space area. Let's look at another example. In Santorini, uh, they've actually used it uh, as a way of making the, the uh, game board pop out. So it actually looks really pretty, and I, I think it's, it's a really cool way to sort of bring it to life and just really give flavor to the world. Um, they've actually got this 3D game board here with the surface beneath it. And you'll see, once again, they've also used it to give you uh, references to what's going to go in those bags. So this, this surface is pre-created and then the bag is placed on top of it when they actually put the objects into the game. Let me show you what it looks like in the back end. So you'll see here, this is the surface for Santorini. And you'll see it's actually just a grid of nine JPEGs that have been, that have been split up and then uploaded to our software. And then they end up looking like this. So it couldn't be simpler to make a surface, but a surface can really highlight different aspects of your game and really just make things pop and bring them to life. It's really good for directing your player's attention and making sure that they know what they're looking at. In Tabletopia, most objects can be assigned their own custom sounds, and this can really enhance your gameplay in a lot of ways. Let's have a look. So first off, you can see here that you can actually add background music and this can be turned on and off by the DM. For example, with this one, if I just flip it, we get some nice ambience. We get a, that nice sci-fi background sound and I can just flip it back to turn it off. Now, um, it's also useful in narrative games where you need a storyteller or an object to give you a speech. So for example, if I click on this little uh, wizardy dude here, the balance of the ancient powers is disrupted. Only you can prevent the cataclysm. Sounds dramatic. Also here, we've got custom actions specifically assigned to different objects. For example, this dice can be rolled. Ow, oh, and it's all explodey. This card, which strengthens you, has that little rock crumbly sound as you flip it over. And this eagle will also do a little screech when you drag it around. It's also useful for reference info. Uh, so this can help you with uh, GM'd games, storytelling games. Uh, for example, if I were to bring this up full screen. Greetings, traveler. It's a dangerous place to be. A goblin lives nearby. It appears all of a sudden and scares everyone. Sounds spooky. And finally, you can actually just assign keys to a maple piano. So, you can do this for any object that you have at your disposal and... I don't know, maybe you can make something new and cool with it. Sometimes it can make sense to split your game into multiple setups. Now setups are a predefined state of the board that players will enter into when they when they load up the game. And this can be really useful when you have variable setup at different player counts or even at different player counts that just have less components. Uh, for example, let's have a look at some let's have a look at some. So here we have the solo setup for sides, and in this you'll see we have one player board and the Automa. Whereas compare and contrast that to the five player setup, you've got five player boards, you've got all their individual components, and it's just a lot going on. Whereas if you're one player, all you need is this. So in that way, it's useful uh, to consolidate space and make sure that your players are only dealing with information that's relevant to them. It's also useful when you have a game that has variable setup. Uh, for example, say a game that requires you to remove cards if you're playing at three players instead of two, or a game that requires you to add certain tiles into the deck if you're playing with five players. So this can be a really nice way to make sure that the game is in a state that's good to go for your players as soon as they enter the game. 
Now let's talk about creating magnetic maps in Tabletopia. So magnetic maps are a special feature that allow for automatic alignment and rotation of chosen types of objects placed on the map. Um, its purpose is to ease the positioning of objects on the game boards and cards. So for example, when a user drags and drops an object above a magnetic map cell, this object is automatically placed into the center of the magnetic map cell and will align itself to the correct orientation or sticky itself to a grid. Basically, you can manipulate it uh, so that it snaps into a more um, aesthetically pleasing position. So uh, a magnetic map can be attached to the game boards, cards and tiles. Uh, cards, tiles, tokens, game pieces, dice and counters can independently interact with magnetic maps. Um, magnetic maps can be rectangular or round. Uh, and the angle of the automatic rotation can be set for each cell of the magnetic map. Um, an object can also automatically be flipped when, uh, to a specific side, such as the front or back, uh, when placed on a magnetic map. Let's have a look at a few examples of what I'm actually talking about. So here we are in the game Role Player, and you'll see that uh, the discard pile is a special section and the uh, market is a special section. These are actually assigned to a magnetic map. So for example, were I to take a card and discard it, put it on the discard pile, I release, it automatically flips over and neatly places itself there. And then if I draw something new from the market and place it in the predefined space, it'll automatically flip over and snap into that position. So with this, we've used the magnetic map to create predefined positions that these cards will snap to and predefined orientations that these cards will uh, flip to. Now, uh, here in Subterra, we're going to actually be placing uh, grids of tiles. So we've got a grid here, and this grid has been assigned a magnetic map. So I'm going to draw a temple tile. Just going to place it there. And you'll see that it just snaps into the nearest tile that I'm dropping it onto. And this is a really neat way where I'm not having, having to fiddle with making sure that the tiles align just right. Uh, I can actually just drag and drop them and they'll just go where they need to. So it's very useful and I can just rotate the tiles as I want and they'll just snap onto the grid. So again, I've used the magnetic map here to make sure that things are going perfectly into the right place. Uh, for example, here in Santorini, we've actually used the magnetic map to make sure that every player's miniature is going into the center of, their, of the tile that they're on. So for example, I'll just grab one token here, pop it down, and it snaps right into the center. Same with any of them. It'll snap into the nearest center. So here it, here it ends up nowhere because it's not placed on the center of either. But if I place it sort of near the center, it snaps in. Near the center, it snaps in. So in this way, you can use magnetic maps to actually manipulate pieces in a much neater way that allows players to really just take away that sort of fiddliness uh, that comes with the digital environment. Now, the actual specifics of making a magnetic map are a little uh, complex, but we have a very helpful guide in our knowledge base that you can consult. So please be sure to check that out. So random elements are specially designed to allow authors to automatically randomize components of a game when it's started. So if you're going to add a deck of cards into your game and you don't want to make players shuffle them every time, uh, you can make sure that you use a random element. Uh, random objects can be created in your objects editor by creating a group of objects that are all the same object type and size. And once all these objects are processed, a random element option becomes available for your group. Let's have a look at that. So here I've got a bunch of cards and they're all contained within a group folder. Now uh, this random element object has appeared and so I'm going to toggle that on and now all of the cards in this folder will be pulled when we need a random object. So if we actually go into the setup editor you'll now see here that I've got a bunch of random objects in the deck and these are all the objects that were in that folder that were in that folder we created before. Now they're all contained in a deck. I've got 16 of them because I've got 16 objects. So when the player plays the game, those, are, those random elements will actually be replaced by one of these cards that um, were in that folder. 
And you'll see that if I try to add a 17th card, uh, it won't work because every card uh, in this random deck is actually being replaced by a single of these objects from the group that we created. So in this way, you can randomize elements to make sure that your players are always getting the setup shuffled ahead of time. And one thing that's cool about random objects is that you can actually use them to influence the variety and chance and luck that something will be drawn. So in this case, we have 16 cards in our random elements group, but we can actually add two, three, four. There are now four copies of this card that could be pulled from the card pool. And this way you can sort of increase the odds that that card will be pulled when the players are getting randomized objects. Now let's talk about customizing object behaviors. So one of the more powerful and flexible features of Tabletopia is the ability to customize object behaviors. Almost every object in Tabletopia can be customized to allow uh, or forbid uh, flipping, moving, rotating, and other interactions like drawing and dealing. So there's a few reasons to customize your object behaviors. You want to reduce the options in the context menu and streamline the user interface. For example, if during the game you always deal uh, up to seven cards, uh, you can limit the deal option to just seven rather than giving players the option to pick one through ten. Uh, you can also use it as a form of rules enforcement um, or helping, such as setting deal and draw uh, values to remind players how many cards they can take during the game. You can uh, use some objects in new ways with these. So for example, you can forbid interaction for a miniature and you can have like this really cool uh, looking static statue on the game table. Uh, so players can't move it, but it's there just to be a nice center piece. Uh, dice without roll and flip can play as the role of resource cubes um, or other tokens. And each side can be different so that one object can represent many different things based on which face you set it to in the setup editor. Um, so you have a couple of options. You have shuffle, take, deal, draw up to, draw, draw up to, and placement restrictions, whether it can go in your hand or in a deck. Um, you want to restrict deck, for example. Uh, say there's a reference card that players shouldn't be able to shuffle into a deck or shouldn't be able to pick up into their hand. So let's go have a look at that in action. Here we have the uh, game Between Two Cities. Now I'm looking in the objects editor here and we're going to uh, make some options for this blue bag. So I'm going to click the little editor here and I can customize the object behaviors that are allowed in this game. So right now you'll see that the only things that, ca that can be done with the blue bag are movement, rotation, locking and unlocking, dealing seven cards to players, and drawing seven cards to players. Because in this game, there'll be a bunch of tiles in the, in the, in the um, bag, and each player will receive seven. That's the only situation players will be taking tiles from the bag, so what's the point of allowing them to take any other number from the bag? So now, if we actually go into the game, you'll see that that, that bag has been placed into the game, and we right click the menu, we have rotate, lock, deal, seven, and draw seven. And these are the only options available because it streamlines the function of this object to what it can only really do in the context of actually playing the game. So customizing object behaviors is a really powerful way to sort of guide your players, direct them, and give them more enforcement and more guidance during the gameplay. Now let's talk about picture counters. A picture counter is a bunch of up to 24 picture slides that allow you to keep track of different parameters during the game. Unlike a regular token counter, a picture counter uses a series of images rather than numbers. So let's go have a look at an example right now. So first we've got the ability to create dials. You can fully imitate the dial used in the game, uh, just create full pictures for each possible value. Or you can make a new, more compact version. Dials are made big because it's the only way it's possible in the real world. You'll see in this example that you can represent the health and the fighting ability of this speci specific character, but if I were to scroll through it, I can now have the level 2 character, the level 3 character, 
and then and level four and so on and so this allows me to compact information and all you're looking at are a bunch of slides essentially that i'm rotating through but once i rotate them through it kind of looks like i'm actually manipulating the object itself now another way you can use picture counters is to make cards and tokens which evolve and change throughout the game this is really good for legacy style games or games where cards have altered states during the game so you'll see i've got a card here with the first ability text and i can scroll through put the second ability text maybe the third condition text and so I can modify these values just by scrolling on my mouse wheel. And so re again, all I'm doing is rotating through a series of pictures. Now, uh, you can also use it for indicators. For example, things that have a toggle. Uh, so in this case, I'm just going to toggle this on and off. Toggle this on and off. And rather than dragging a cube onto here to indicate it, this is a more elegant way to just switch things on and off. Now, um, you can also use it for reference sheets and rule books that are displayed on the table. This is really nice for really compact, quick reference um, that, that needs to be split over multiple pages. For example, if I double click on this to bring it into focus, I can now just go left and right with the buttons down here. And you can see I can look at the rules very quickly, very quickly refer to the different parts of the game. And I can just unfocus it to get out of it. I can also just use the mouse wheel to scroll while it's on the board if I do want to quickly run through it here. And finally, you can also use it for flat dice. Uh, the beauty of picture counters being flat dice is that they can be they can be flat on the table, which adds a bit more style and just um, makes it a little less goofy. They can have up to 24 sides, and the sides can be of any shape. So you can actually, you don't have to display a number in here. It could be a specific icon that's relevant to your game. Uh, but I can roll these like I would any other dice. See, I'm just hitting R right now, and they're just rolling. Or I can just scroll through them. And again, you can put up to 24 images on these. So picture counters are a really nice way to compact information and communicate with your players what's happening and actually tell a story digitally. And there you have it. Nine design tips to bring your Tabletopia games to the next level. Of course, you can access our knowledge guides and our knowledge base that's available on our website. And you can email us or hit me up on uh, our social media if you have any questions and we'll be sure to help you and get back to you. Really, designing your games couldn't be simpler. So why don't you give it a try now and get your next game on Tabletopia? Thank you for joining me. I've been Mark and I'll see you around.